We're going to uh, welcome our online family this morning. From wherever you're joining us, we're glad that you've been able to join with us. Um, If you're in New South Wales, be assured we are praying for you today. Particularly those in and around the mid-north coast area. Um, I had someone let me know that they're not having church today, so they'll be watching here. So those from Taree and Port Macquarie. In those areas, be assured we're praying for you. If we're looking for opportunities to pray for people today, then pray for the young family that lost their house yesterday on the North Coast. It was just a heartbreaking situation. But we're here this morning starting our brand new series on the last words of Christ. And uh, we're going to look at that a little later in the service. But what's today about? Today is the day that God's made. And then the next line says, I will rejoice, right? It's a choice. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Do we always have good days? If you do, God bless you. I don't. But when we have all of our days, whatever it might be, we're choosing to see where God is at work in the midst of all of that, aren't we? So we're going to sing together in just a second. Uh, Today is the day you have made. Now, it's not the same one that we sang for a long, long time. This is the day. This is a new arrangement by Lincoln Brewster. Today is the day. So thanks to the worship team, we'll have that now. Would you like to stand? Because this is a bit of a boppy one. Hands to yours, believing there's 
so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good Is good Today is the day you have been I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day Today is the day. Good job. So we're, uh, this morning we are having our, um, an opportunity to reflect on the last five or six weeks, this is week six I think of our self-denial um, appeal where we're looking to support work overseas in Brazil, South Africa, Ukraine, I India, and there's, I've got no idea, there's four got no idea. I just had a complete mind blank. But um, we're going to uh, have some opportunity now to reflect on what's happened over the last few weeks. And then when the band uh, plays a song called Knowing You, Jesus, Knowing You, we're going to have the offering and the altar service will inc be incorporated as part of our normal offering. So just place your altar service envelopes into the offering bags and that will be sorted out by somebody with on a higher pay bracket than me tomorrow. All right? No worries. May I say nothing? May I do nothing? May I seek nothing but truth? Let my soul
as Wes said, the band are going to play Knowing You, Jesus. And during that time, the offering will be received, including the self-denial envelopes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give to you out of the abundance that we have. Lord, we have given, especially this morning, to the self-denial appeal. We have seen video footage of how others in, across our globe live. And Lord, if the few dollars that we give can make a difference, we ask that you would bless the offering. That it would be poured out into those places. We've seen some amazing things happen through the self-denial appeal across the world as it has been going for many years. And Lord, for the offering received for the core this morning, I do ask that you would bless it as well. May all monies, all gifts, all talents be used for the extension of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. Jesus heals a paralytic. The words are up on the screen. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. <clears throat> went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading this morning. And just to add to our reading this morning, we're going to watch a video clip and it's also called The Paralytic Man. So can I have a lights person just grab the lights? Thanks, Amy. Who has your plan? <laughs> there wasn't a plan. No, no, no. When you're desperately in need, you don't stop and think that digging a hole in the roof of a stranger's house might be a bad idea. You just do it. So we did it. And how we pulled that operation off, that's a story for another day. <laughs> and it's a good one. 
You, you should have seen everybody's face when they were lowering me down, all sprawled out on that mat. At one point, I just looked at everybody and I was just like, hello. <laughs> everybody was shocked. Except for Jesus. It's like he was expecting me. Jesus, he had this big smile on his face. He looked up at my friends. He looked at me. And he said these words. He said, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now listen, I wasn't being lowered down on a mat because I was exhausted from running a marathon. I was being lowered on a mat because my legs didn't work. So when he said he was going to forgive my sins, I was thinking, sins? What about my legs? But I just didn't get it then. See, in saying he could forgive sins, Jesus was kind of, well, he wasn't kind of saying it. He was, he was claiming to be God. Now, I don't have time to tell you everything the Pharisees told us we had to do to earn forgiveness. Needless to say, it'd be easier to move a mountain than to find forgiveness. And here, Jesus is just handing it out. Most everybody in that room had to be thinking the same thing. Who does this guy think he is? Who does this guy think he is? You can't forgive sins if you're not God. And if you're not God, you can't do this. I went in there hoping that I could stand on my own two feet and I walked out free from sin. That's a miracle that doesn't just change me. That changes the world. Last words. There's famous last words, isn't there? We think about last words all the time and we think about the words that people say and we think, oh, that's absolutely attributed to them. Anyone, can, anyone think of famous last words that come to mind? It might be ones like, while women weep, as they do now. We know who said that, right? William Booth. It may be that this one comes to mind. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Walt Disney was the one that said that. I alone can't change the world, but I can cast a stone onto the water and create ripples. Mother Teresa was the one that said that. These are famous quotes from people, and they are, you would argue, two people who quite honestly have changed the world in different ways. I would argue that these last words of Christ that we're going to look at for the next few weeks change the world in ways that Mother Teresa couldn't and neither could Walt Disney. Imagine being in that first, uh, when they gathered together in that house. You've been waiting all day in the heat and you got yourself a front row seat. I'm going to get to listen to Jesus. This is this teacher that everyone's been talking about and now he's come home and I've got myself a front row seat. I've been waiting for ages and ages and ages outside in the, in the blistering sun and I got myself a front row seat and then all of a sudden, somebody pushes in. Comes in through the roof and you're like, hang on a minute, you didn't wait. You jumped the queue. We've all been in the tuck shop line at school, haven't we? One of the greatest fights, I'm sure, I'm not sure if it still happens, but did when I was at school, there's no pusher-inners. 
right? You don't push in in the tuck shop line. You have to wait your turn. Apparently nobody cares anymore. That's the good authority I've had this morning. But it was certainly a thing when I was at school and it could end up being uh, the, the cause of uh, intense moments of fellowship between students. And yet here we have recorded somebody who absolutely pushed in, not because of any capacity that he had, but by the capacity of his friends to say that we care enough about our friend that we're going to rip the roof apart and bring him to the feet of Jesus. The crowds were growing because of people were hearing about Jesus. They were hearing about the powerful miracles he was performing. And he found himself down at the water's edge. What happened in the interaction that happened with that young man on that day, could have been old man, I don't know, that man that day impacted his life in such a way that it changed his life and gave him the opportunity to change others. Jesus healed people, that's recorded in scripture. He could have easily just said, take your mat and walk. But his first response is, your sins are forgiven. Let's take a look at those, Jesus' last seven words on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first of the magnificent, the first of the last words of Jesus that we're looking at is the one that Jesus cries out from the cross where he says, Father, forgive them. As we begin to think and listen about upon the last words of Jesus, we notice that when Jesus is speaking, he's speaking not to us but to God. He's speaking to God on our behalf. Part of the person of Jesus is that he is, by very nature, a relational being, right? He's speaking to God the Father on behalf of all of creation. In the beginning of John chapter 1, we read in there the interconnection between in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And yet in these verses... We read on where God became flesh and dwelt among us. A couple of years ago for our uh, Christmas season, we looked at Jesus in the neighbourhood. And uh, that is this verse uh, under Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, the message, where he says that that God came down from heaven and dwelt among us and moved into the neighbourhood. Great picture, right? that he moved into our neighbourhood. Not with an overnight bag, but he unpacked his stuff and stuck around. Ever tried to chat with young people? Um, What are you doing? I don't know. Did anyone else ever hear that? All the time? That's because you've got their headphones out. When I speak to young people and go, what are you up to? I get silence because they've got their headphones in or something else. There's other things distracting them. And I'm not judging them. It's just how it is. But the reality is adults say the same thing. Do we know what we're doing in life? Lots of the time, no. Loved the, the sharing that we had this morning where someone referenced the fact that there was mess. That... They reminded us that mess is okay. Because I think in the middle of mess, God creates a message. For that that guy that was that guy that was uh, on the mat could never work. He didn't have any status. He wasn't in within society, he wasn't worth anything. And yet God saw him in the midst of what was his mess and said, 
Your sins are forgiven. Have you ever wondered how long it takes us sometimes to work out what we're going to do when we don't know what we're doing? There's tensions, right? What am I going to wear today? Where am I going to go to have a feed after church? Am I going to have coffee and tea at coffee or tea at morning tea? Actually, it doesn't bother me. I'll take either. Whoever's on morning tea today, coffee or tea is fine. So, um, where am I going to go on my next holiday? Please take Queensland because it's just easier right now. What am I supposed to do as a parent? What do I do when they're crying and I can't fix it? What do you do when kids turn up and they try to make you help them with algebra and you're like, it didn't make sense the first time. I don't want to look at it again. We spend so much of our life trying to work out what we're doing and yet I think we can join with the teenagers in using those same three words. I don't know. Lots of our life, we don't know. Nobody gives us, gives us an instruction manual for every single situation in all of our life. If there was one, it'd be well worn. If you're like me, there are lots of times in our life when I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to being a husband. I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to being a father. I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to being a son or a student or a leader or a neighbour. And let me tell you, I definitely don't know what I'm doing when it comes to being a pastor, particularly through a pandemic. Nobody taught us that. But what I did was just love people and hope that God would look after the rest. Because as was um, the encouragement we sh was shared earlier in the service, we're not, there's not perfect people, right? And in the midst of imperfect people, we get something given to us by God. Not because we ask for it, it's offered. It's his first step. Step one, you get forgiveness. Have you noticed that it didn't, it was the thing that was offered first. Nobody asked for it. Jesus interacts with us from a position of forgiveness. How often do we think we've got to be good enough, strong enough, perfect enough for God to love us? But it's not like that at all. In the midst of our imperfection, our list of things that disqualify us, he says, I forgive you. I love you enough and I forgive you. I think one of the reasons why God offers us forgiveness as his first step is because we would take ages to ask. For those of us that are in the room that, have, um, that are married, we could go around the room and get funny stories about, you'd chatted about when you were going to ask the other person when they were going to get married and, you, and then there was this level of impatience. I'll check at morning tea for those that are smirking in the room. I'd love to hear the stories. But I think sometimes we would, because we see ourselves as broken people, we would wait for ourselves to be good enough before we come to God and say, righto, I think I've done enough under my own steam now, can you forgive me? We'd wait for us to be almost perfect and blameless before we come to God. Even though we feel that, like at times we don't know what we are doing, God knows exactly what he's doing 
And he share, Paul shares that with the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5 where he says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. Part of the nature and character of God is that he is a God who is full of forgiveness, especially when people don't know what they're doing. William Willimon is a um, Christian author. He wrote a book called Pastor. And uh, he wrote a, a second book called um, Companion. It's a companion to that first volume. I realised that companion means you should read the first one first, which I didn't do. But William Willimon sh- suggests that God's the phenomenon that is, co- that is God's forgiveness for the world is a preemptive strike. A preemptive strike so that we can live a life of freedom. God made a preemptive strike against the powers of sin and darkness with, loaded with forgiveness. The words for today, the last words of Christ, Father, forgive them. Because they do not know what they are doing. It's good news. Because in the midst of us not knowing what we're doing and what the next step is going to be, God is already there positioned to offer forgiveness and freedom found in Jesus. When we look at forgiveness, we always run to 1 John 1 9, don't we? 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Good verse. Not going to delete it from Scripture. But I think it's more than that. Some people memorise it, and certainly I had to when I was younger. However, what Jesus says in Luke 23, 34, took place well before anything we said, or well before anything that uh, was written in the letter in 1 John. Do you realise that almost nobody in the Gospels initiates and asks for forgiveness from Jesus? Jesus is the initiator by telling people something that they weren't even asking for. Your sins are forgiven. Nobody stood at the cross and asked Jesus to forgive them their sins. The text says, if you read it, that what did they do instead? They jeered him, mocked him, cast lots for his clothes. They had no desire to ask for forgiveness at all and yet he offered it even when he was hanging on the cross. Nobody was offered the sinner's prayer whilst they stood around the cross on that day. But God offered them through a preemptive strike Forgiveness through Jesus. Jesus knew that without forgiveness being the first word from the cross, that there'd be no opportunity for God to interact with humanity into the future. In a sense, those initial last words in 21st century language might have been, hey, you're forgiven, let's talk. If you've ever heard the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, you would hear in that story a whole do- a bunch of different characters. And we always think it's about the younger son. And then we always get judgy about the older son. I've got to tell you, it's about neither of them. But both of them, all at the same time. The key to the story is the father who, when he saw his son knowing exactly what he was going to do because the son told him, when he saw the son still a long way off, what did he do? He ran to him and embraced him. Unclean. Wished his dad was dead. All that, That's probably going to qualify, qualify you for not having somebody's love, right? If you're saying, can I have my inheritance, even though dad's still living? And then going and eating from the pig's trough? That's probably going to qualify you for somebody to go, actually, you know what? 
not sure if we can, if I can love you, that actually hurt a lot. But no, he was offered forgiveness. What did the dad say? He embraced him, forgave him. Can we talk? It's important to realize that the word confess in um, 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, is the same word that means that we want to empty ourselves. It's the word homogulus. Therefore, when we confess our sins from a literal and biblical understanding, we are saying the same thing about our condition that Jesus said on the cross. Forgive them. Forgive them. Hey, you're forgiven. Can we talk? If we could role play this concept out in an imaginary conversation between Jesus and ourselves, it might go something like this. Jesus. I'm on the cross because you don't know what you're doing. Me. Jesus, you're right. I don't even know what I'm doing. I say the same things as you're saying about my life. It's a mess. I'm a mess. I really do not know what I'm doing much of the time at all. Jesus. I know you don't know, but you know what? You're forgiven anyway. Confession is the same, saying the same thing about our messed up lives and then walking into the preemptive strike of forgiveness that God offers to each of us. These last words of Christ, Father, forgive them, were the first words of the gospel. Of the good news that Jesus forgives us. Now we could easily wait until we've got all of our ducks in a row and all of our house in order and go, right, it's good. It's almost like we treat our lives like we're having a, uh, an inspection from the real estate, right? Once I've got everything in order and it all looks heaps good and deadly and just how so... That's when I'm going to invite Jesus to come and interact with me. But he doesn't say that. He says that in the midst of the mess, invite me in. I want to offer you forgiveness. Most of us that have lived in, uh, in rental properties over the years, particularly when I was younger, I wanted Mary Poppins to turn up and click her fingers and put everything back where it was supposed to go. But I didn't get Mary Poppins, I had Debbie instead. Um, and she made me help. So Mary Poppins would have been the... I didn't ever see anyone flying in on a cloud though. So it just meant that I had to be an adult and clean up my own mess. But we've all been there, haven't we? Where we've wished that we could just get things in order before we invite God to come and be a part of it. But it's in the midst of the mess that God brings a message. Imagine if that guy, that no one, no one had ever met him when he was laying on the mat and then someone met him for the very first time when he's already walking, if he didn't refer to the mess, he has no message. If he didn't refer to the test, there is no testimony. And for us, if we don't embrace the forgiveness that is found in God, we will be diluting the good news that's found in Jesus Christ. So we must not ignore forgiveness that is offered by Jesus today. We must not pretend like we've got everything perfect because it dilutes the gospel good news message that I am broken and God makes me whole. Like the song we sang this morning, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I used to have a t-shirt. I don't know where it is anymore. I probably got donated. 
it said, I'm the wretch that song talks about. And I am, still. The words that Jesus spoke can change our lives, inside and out, just like the man who Jesus healed on that mat. His life was never the same. May our encounters and interactions with Christ's last words this Easter leave us changed, never to be the same. We're going to sing a chorus in just a moment with the help of the worship team that says, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Sometimes I think we, when life's going, rainbows, lollipops, skittles and fairy floss, we think, oh, I'm good. I don't need to rely on God's interactions in my life. I've got this. When he's offering us freedom, when he's offering us forgiveness, let's not say I've got this, but I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you.
Let's pray. Loving God, we say thank you for all that you have done for us. We say thank you for the gift of your son Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers. Lord, as we journey through this Easter season together, may we accept the gift of your forgiveness, understanding those last words of Christ. Father, forgive them. Lord, as we journey these days together, may your spirit come and minister to us in a fresh way. We've heard the Easter season and the Easter message so many times and in different ways, but God, you are continue to be the same and are the same God. And so we would ask that you would be close to us. May we live out those words of that song, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, just a couple of announcements. Are they not going to come up on the screen purely because I forgot? Just being really honest. All right. Uh, but um, we've got Maroon Dam next weekend for those who are connected with the OWLS program or w- wanting to connect in that way. Maroon Dam, 3 p.m., I think. Uh, if you want to go along to that, please see Alan and Elsa for more details. Um, you probably go to Moogra Dam, actually. It's good. Don't go to Moogra. It's at Maroon. But Mar- I just want to brag about the fact we got rain in the dam and the Reynolds is running, so we're going to have water. So for those that need it, um, and we continue to pray for our farmers uh, in the valley, uh, but we, the Reynolds is running for the first time in... There you are. First time in ages. I was going to ask Neil how long, but it looked like a very flat line. So it's quite a while. A long time? time. We'll go with that. Also next weekend is the Family Store Fashion Parade. Um, So that's at 2pm here. It's a Devonshire tea. And um, just because of the selfless kind of guy that I am, I'm going to taste test those scones um, beforehand. Um, So I'm sure they're going to be great, but that's part of my goal for this week is to get some of those and have a go. But um, that's 2pm here. The money raised from that is going to the Women's Ministries Project this year. And um, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, If you want to know more details about that, then uh, see Debbie. For those that uh, want to still contribute to the self-denial appeal and, and weren't prepared for today, you can give online at selfdenial.info. Just select a Fassifern core. There are some within the community, in our faith community that have already done that and they've given me feedback that it's pretty easy to do. All right, so um, if that's the case, then go, go in, selfdenial.info, choose Fassifern core and you can give in that way. You can give uh, monthly, weekly uh, or in one, one, um, one de- gift as well. Also... Um, You'll notice today that the spacings have been removed from the chairs. Did anyone notice that? Because we don't have to anymore. All right, didn't know where to sit. Um, I'm glad you found a great spot though, Ange. But we've got these invites. Uh, see Debbie at morning tea because we'd love to invite people to come and join with us for our Easter services. Okay, someone that you thought, oh, we haven't seen them in ages. Why don't you get an invite? You can write on the back a personal note of of an invite to them and go and see them. So that's uh, the last last announcement for this morning. I do want to just mention uh, that Barry and Gloria won't be here with us for the next couple of weeks. Evan's upset because he won't have anyone to bag about the Broncos. He'll, he'll tease me instead. Don't worry, Barry. I'll take it. We better win soon. Uh, have a great time away. Uh, a rest and recharge and renew. And uh, we'll see you soon. You may need flippers if Sunshine Coast doesn't... turns into the, uh, you know, the watery well. But um, have an awesome time. Our final song this morning, I want to tell what God has done through Christ, his well-beloved son. The band are going to play for our singing. Yes? 
Let's be upstanding. Let us sing together. benediction. I pray in this week coming that you'll remember his last words. Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. And may the sentiment dwell in your hearts as you interact with others in this Easter period. And may they see his light shine out through you. Be blessed. Amen.